It is four or hours, so let's go ahead and get started. Thank you, Alex, for recording locally. Sorry that I am tethered to my phone. Here's the agenda, nothing crazy. Client updates with a focus on Altair. Um, we will discuss the point brought up by Adrian today on some of the subtleties on um, gossiping sync signatures. We'll talk about Altair planning. Um, thank you, for Perry, for joining uh, to help us discuss and coordinate that. And then general discussion. Uh, the merge call is right before, so I think we got all of that out of our system. Uh, but I think Proto might have a quick update on sharding on the research, and uh, we'll leave him other stuff there at that point. Let's go ahead and get started. How about Teku kick us off? Sure. So we've updated to the Alpha 7 release uh, with the new gossip message ID changes um, and the new uh, rewards for sync committees. Um, that's all up and running. We've kicked off uh, Yurong Pili testnet um, with that. So uh, the details are in the ETH2 testnets um, repo. Uh, a few fixes to the Node Health API to make it work a bit better with. Uh, Kubernetes in particular for us, we now say we're syncing on that API right after startup until we found peers. Previously, we had no peers, so we had nothing to sync. Say, hey, we're in sync because we don't know anybody yet. Um, so we're actually exposing that startup mode now through that API. Uh, that is the main thing. Uh, we've got a lot of fixes for discovery um, that have come out. Um, and a few tweaks to our gossip stuff. Uh, mostly that's just techie specific stuff, but it, a lot of learnings out of the previous DevNets were out there. I think that's us. Thank you. And thanks for putting up the new DevNet. Prism. Hey guys, Terrence here. So um, we aligned to Alpha 7 passing spec tests. We're working on the new validator RBC endpoints, uh, mainly for the SIG committee stuff. And uh, almost done with that. And then we're also working on the networking spec and that's almost done as well. So we're almost there. I think we're on track to start a local interrupt-ish test net to test the for transition um, by end of this week or early next week. And if that goes well, we will um, jump into the multi-client test net with you guys as well. And uh, on the maintenance front, um, the, we are planning to release our uh, E2 API support um, by next release. So that's very exciting. And uh, other than that, just uh, bug fixes. And then, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Great, glad to hear the progress. Nimbus. Hi, Mami here. So on the Altair front, we also updated to Alpha 7. Uh, besides that, we still continue working on um, optimizing Nimbus and we made a contribution to significantly accelerate um, everything that requires uh, public keys uh, from the database by not compressing the public keys. And we also um, improved uh, or cache uh, or state cache. Uh, besides that, uh, we are working on the validator client. Uh, we have a PR sitting there and um, we managed to control Lighthouse with a Nimbus validator client. So we are in good shape. And uh, in parallel to that, we are also uh, adding uh, more and more uh, API endpoints to be in line with the if 2 API uh, requirements. Great, thank you. Loadstar. Hey, so on the Altair front, uh, we are still on Alpha 6. Uh, we're in the process of upgrading to 7, but we've just been fixing various performance issues and stability issues that we have come up just either during our own internal ephemeral test nets or trying to interrupt with um, Teku's DevNet. Uh, as of right now, uh, it looks um, pretty good locally. Um, 
we can upgrade to Alpha 7 and see see what it looks like. Other than that, um, been doing some other optimizations and things. We, we're going to delete uh, our pending attestation cache because we found out it's not very DOS resistant and looking for feedback or ideas how to actually implement something like that. Uh, we stopped updating our fork choice uh, head on every call. Uh, and now instead we're caching that result and then updating it only after processing every block. And then as far as like uh, publishing a, a Lodestar, we've, uh, we pulled out uh, our API client into a separate package, which is pretty nice just to be able to um, you know, query uh, an ETH2 endpoint, uh, pulled that into a package and published it, and also pulled out our light client prototype into a package. And we started releasing nightly builds and integrated all that into our Docker system. So, yeah. Nice. And on the light client, is the prototype primarily on the server or on the client itself? Uh, it's a client that uh, talks to a beacon node use over like the REST API with a few additional pieces for sending over updates and proofs. Gotcha. Thank you. And Lighthouse. Hello, everyone. Paul here. Um, so with regard to Altair, we've got Alpha 7 merged into our Altair branch. Uh, it's working well, passing tests. We're following Yurong Pili. Um, we seem to be getting sync committee messages. We had a couple of issues with the new configs, um, but we sorted those out and kind of, yeah, it seems to be working now. We're looking into it to try and find um, some bugs or weirdness, which I'm sure we'll find. We're also with Altair, we're patching an issue with FAC. We had some, some problems about signing just around the fork boundary. So we're going to fix that. Uh, we're still finishing some committee caching stuff. Uh, and then we'll be working on merging um, our Altair branch into our primary branch at some point. Um, out of Altair now, last week we released version 1.4.0 and it went quite well, which is nice. We dropped our memory from like six gig to like 1.5 gig. Uh, dropped calls to F1 nodes by about 80%. And the users seem very happy, so which makes us happy. Uh, and moving forward, we're gonna be pushing forward with Altair and um, hopefully cutting a version 1.5.0 release, um, maybe end of this month, start of next month, which should have some CPU savings and a bunch of other features. Excellent, thank you. Um, on this recent DevNet, Adrian, did it do the transition or did it start from Altair? It did the transition. Uh, that was some of the confusion I caused for Lighthouse. It's at Epoch 20. Um, okay. Because I forgot to enable it as we passed through Epoch 10 when it was first going to happen. Feature oh, gotcha. flags are great <laughs> until you forget to set them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you, you missed where you intended and then switched it to 20. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, that's gone through the transition. Um, which the uh, previous ones did as well for just at Epoch 10. Okay, great. Good to hear that. Um, let's let's actually do planning and then we can talk about the sync committee signature broadcast time and cache. Um, okay, so we're making progress. Adrian, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think posting these dev nets up and doing some initial interop is, is uh, invaluable. Um, I think that most of you have met Peritosh, uh, Perry, who is at the EF, um, who does primarily ETH2 DevOps related tasks. So you've probably run into him with test nets and other things. Um, Perry is going to be joining our calls here and, and getting his hands dirty with um, various test net things. Uh, so helping set dates, helping pick uh, and host configs and, and that kind of stuff. And then maybe uh working through problems if they arise like hitting epoch 10 and forgetting and then uh changing it to epoch 20. uh perry do you want to just do a quick intro to yourself um yeah hi um like danny said my name is perry Tosh. just call me perry and just looking forward to working with all of you um hi again too thank you cool um so i think the the steps obviously look like short-lived devnets some longer-lived devnets 
and uh, then picking dates on our two test nuts and picking a date, date aka epoch on um, mainnet. Um, in terms of, I think we'll do iteration on the short-lived dev nuts. Um, Adrian and or Perry can maybe pick and host another one or two over the next week or two, um, if that seems valuable. Um, and then what's the current temperature on earliest for one of our large testnet forks? Um, is that a two week target? Is that a four week target? Is in something like PM on or Prado. Yeah. yeah. I would I would think that two week is, is probably too early. Um just looking broadly. Um I'd be definitely more in a four week kind of bracket given those two options. Okay. So and I think that's where I would fall on that as well. Um Terrence, did I see you on mute? Yeah, I share the same sentiment as Paul. I would say between two to four weeks, likely leading towards four weeks, because I prefer more like local interrupt testing or small scale testing before that. Okay, so we are two weeks puts us at the first of July. Uh, four weeks puts us at the fifteenth of July. So let's state the intention of continued interop short-lived dev nets and maybe um, keep on running once a bunch of people have joined it and do some testing and just sending random transactions and things like that on the first which is two weeks the intention would be to set a fork date for one of our large test nets um, maybe in the two-week time horizon after that so heading towards the 15th of july um, and maybe if we're comfortable at that point, setting some targets for a, a main net fork, um, it very well, we might get to the first, be comfortable setting a test net fork, but then wanting to regroup on the 15th, which would be another call before we, um, actually maybe we'll, the, the intention would be to fork one of those then to get to the 15th, um, and then set fork targets for um if things had gone well for targets for the other test net and for main at that point um i think definitely in the august um, early mid-august horizon for an earliest main net fork um does that all sound about what we're thinking in terms of this is reasonable targets this isn't too aggressive but will keep us keep moving Yeah, I think that sounds about right. I think the the key thing we need to get onto now in terms of forking test nets is getting users used to the fact that it's coming and coming fairly soon and they will have relatively short notice to upgrade. Um, right. Because otherwise it's going to go very badly when the chain just splits. Yeah, and we can, I guess once, once we pick a, a main net target, I think we'll probably do a minimum from announcing that to the mainnet launch of four weeks, I think is is what is the minimum given often on forks on the other side of this thing. Um, I will write a blog post target release Monday, making it very clear that this is coming um, and also talk with some of the East Staker folks to make this is that make sure that they've begun discussing that within their community as well. Um, sorry, just a quick question to everyone here. Um, yep. Is every team comfortable with us starting um, to report uh, bugs, crashes um, that are related to the consensus um, state transitions of Altair? Sorry, I'll, I'll ask the, the question differently, perhaps. <laughs> Who's not uh, ready yet to uh, receive crash reports? That they would be confidentially, confidentially disclosed. Is that right, Mitty? 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We'll usually pick one or two people from uh, each team and uh, liaise with them directly and uh, disclose uh, those findings directly. Also, usually inform uh, Danny and or Proto of those. Right, because there's a chance that something that crashes Altair might be able to, at least in a similar vein, crash mainnet. Potentially, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's All right, cool. Well, I'll take it as yeah, I'll take it as uh, you guys are happy for us to uh, disclose some of those bugs. So, um, yeah, might get a message from me over the next few days. I had another question. Um, are teams thinking about doing like a quick audit just for the diff that uh, you guys have for a tear? This is something that I've thought about but haven't formally made a decision on. So I don't, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about thinking about it. It's not that this is correct but it's certainly not done on a per fork basis for most uh, ETH1 mainnet clients. Uh, that's not saying, again, that it is correct, um, but they rely heavily on testing and, and test nets and assume that their architecture is, is generally correct and that they and those processes are the things that are going to best find uh, consensus bugs, which is probably true from a two-week audit perspective, but... Extra eyes is never a bad thing. If you do intend to do that, you need to knock on somebody's door immediately. <laughs> um, as you're all probably well aware, auditors are extremely backlogged. Yeah, fair. It's just a thought. Yeah, realistically, I don't think it'll probably happen before the target date. Um, on that front, well, we've actually... Oh, go on. Yeah, I was going to ask, have the spec been audited? You've been looking at it, right, Yasik? I have. I love finding bugs and things. Um, the spec has not been audited. Uh, the spec was audited to some extent quite a long time ago at the phase zero spec freeze. Um, I will note that about 10, maybe 20 times the amount of uh, issues and bugs were reported outside of that audit process than from that audit process. Okay, Adrian, would you mind uh, discussing the, introducing the issue that you brought up this morning? Yeah, so uh, in the earlier test nets, we found that we were losing gossip messages. Basically, the, the inclusion rate for sync committee signatures has been really low. Uh, with the message ID changes, that jumped up to about 70% inclusion rate, but we were still uh, missing a bunch. And it turned out that it's because uh, the network was functioning really well. So we were producing a block every slot and then immediately producing a sync signature. And uh, for both nodes actually in the network, they were managing to process the sync signature before they actually imported the block. And so they wound up ignoring most of the signatures. Um, and it's just the same race condition we've seen with attestations if you publish them when you first receive a block uh, and other nodes don't have any, any caching save for later type behavior. Um, you get this race condition between the block and the, the sync committee signature or, or the attestation uh, actually being ready, causing, causing you to drop some. Um, I've run an experiment uh, this evening with delaying producing sync committee signatures to the four second mark in the slot. And we're not getting 100% participation yet, but we're missing entire subnets. Uh, at, at a time. So I think what's happening is that we're randomly not getting an aggregator. Um, I need to do one more log message to prove that, but um, I'm pretty sure that we're actually getting perfect inclusion rate of signatures now, and we just sometimes don't aggregate. So essentially that, that delay solves the problem. Um, and we now just need to have a choice between whether we 
uh, I think there are three proposals on the table. One is just don't publish signatures early when you get a block, always wait for the four second mark. The other was that we introduce a, a cache. So you hold on to signatures if you don't have the, the block they're pointing to until the end of the slot. Uh, and the third was Yasek's uh, suggestion that there's a random delay after you get the block um, of between, I think, a quarter of a second and a second. Um, it, I, there's a bunch of arguing over semantics, but I think I think we just pick one of those really. Um, yeah, and my, any of them are probably going to work. My gut would be to go with the second and introduce a short-lived cache so that you can kind of have the dispersal of attestation messages not all being blasted at exactly the same time um, and reuse the mechanism uh, that protects attestations from, from having the same issue. Um, obviously the cache I think should be much more short lived on the order of a slot rather than I think on the order of an epoch. Um, and we get to ideally reuse kind of the, the similar logic from that, that structure. Yeah, I mean, that's the way I lean as well. Um, partly because I already have the attestation case, so I can plug it in relatively easily. Um, for any client who doesn't do that yet, that's obviously more work. Um, so that's a consideration. And it just feels, it's a deterministic solution. You are never going to reject a signature because you don't have the block yet. But- Assuming you, know, you will get pretty, the block. <laughs> is, that's is it the possible small... to build a DOS resistant cache? Well, I think so, because you've got, at most you're going to hold it for 12 seconds and at most you're going to hold 512 signatures because you ignore anything that's not from this slot and you ignore anything that you've already seen from that validator. But you can get, um, can't you get non, you can't always verify the signatures of the things that you put into that cache. Is that, is that true? That is probably true. Mm -hmm. um, you can Why can't you can verify the signatures? You may not have that fork. Yeah, if you, well, if you don't have the block, you don't have anything. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you don't, the block roots you in, in a fork and therefore shuffling. Right, but the shuffling, I mean, the shuffling is in the order of a day. That's true. You could just try and verify it against your head and you'd be right 99.9% of the time. Um, yeah, I mean, if you reject it on a, on, a, on a sync committee shuffling, you're like on a way different fork and you can probably drop it. Yeah, I'm not saying the case is like definitely a bad idea. I think the delay is also a good idea because I, I, I made an argument somewhere else, but if, if we know that we're going to have to cache these things, then why make every node on the network cache it rather than just the sender hold it for a little bit more? That's, that's one argument. And then another argument is that if we just have some delay, then you can get by without a cache. Um, and if the cache isn't a perfect cache, like in this case where we can't always verify the signatures going into it, then there's like, you know, the, the, cache, the cache isn't a perfect deterministic solution. Um, and we already have this problem with attestations. Like I think Lodestar mentioned at the start of it, how do you make the attestation cache DOS resistant? You can't, um, same with this one, you can't. So I think I'm not saying the cache is a bad idea, but mm -hmm. I'd probably say delay it and cache it. Um, so I'd argue that the, this cache is a lot more DOS resistant than the attestation cache because of the way the, I mean, the current sync committee has been known for like an entire day before it becomes the sync committee. So it's almost certainly finalized. Um, but the, then the, the randomness, I, why does the randomness look much different than this? Because if I wait 0.25 seconds, uh, or, or on a random stretch between that, like what does that actually buy me? Because I can still end up sending a signature to somebody who hasn't seen their block yet. I guess, I mean, it's probably not thinking that it's only 512, it probably doesn't earn you a whole lot, but just, I guess, looking from like a broader network perspective, you know, if you're gonna, you've got a message, right? Do you, does the send, and, and you know that, that every, the receivers all need like half a second before they can process it, do you, do you hold it on the sender side or, or does every receiver hold it until they get it? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that that's the strongest argument, you know, but that, that's, that's where I was going with it. Yeah. I, I guess, think, but I if, if I, I I'm also, it's also network latency. It's not just like the processing of the block into, um, into the, into the actual state, which unless you're telling me it's like almost all, that's almost always the dominant factor. 
Uh, yeah, it's, it's an ever-present factor. I want to add one more question, which is basically that losing an attestation, uh, by and large, doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, it'll get included. Somebody will have seen it, and then is likely to get included anyway. Um, how bad is it to lose a sync committee? It's certainly a lot yeah. less forgiving. Oh, what was that? It's certainly a lot less forgiving. You've only got one slot to get in. There are far fewer aggregators that might be around, that kind of thing. But and would it be worth to introduce some sort of forgiveness mechanism in general? I mean, this was during the attestation discussions, we were discussing whether mm, the attestation inclusion delay should be increased in order to allow for more leniency on uh, block versus attestation timing. Um, would that be an option here? I mean, it's an option. It's a trade-off in terms of the optimal latency to um, follow the chain as a light client. If you if you added a minimum inclusion delay by if it was to follow two slots instead of one slot, then you'd have um, twenty four seconds for your uh, node to be able to follow the head rather than twelve. I think one of the things the bits of data we're missing in this is that we we don't have a a decent sized network that we're seeing how this actually behaves in the real world. So I've got two nodes that are you know right next to each other in AWS. Uh, it's not really surprising they're getting the block all at the same time and it's all happening very fast. Um, whereas even on you know, Piemont and Prada, we're seeing a much bigger distribution of when blocks arrive and um, you know, tech publishers at a station straight away, Lighthouse currently drops them if it doesn't know the block. It doesn't seem to be a problem. Our attestation inclusion rates are pretty good. Um, so on a bigger network, how big a problem this is, and and you know, so you're not necessarily always needing to cache the signature. Uh, and a lot of these questions about how likely it is to get dropped um, are still unknowns, effectively. I'd say, if possible, I'd like to solve this in the P2P spec. Um, which can be done with minimal damage uh, to moving towards a spec freeze, uh, especially on the state transition side networks that have slightly different or nodes on the same network that have slightly different agreement on how they're handling this uh, case would still be able to hang out and chat with each other. Um, so if possible, I'd like to solve it with one of the two or one of the suggestions that just touches the P2P rather than adding some sort of induced uh, delay on the on the state transition side. Um, if we want to gather more data, that's, I don't think it's critical that we conform on the solution immediately right now, but we should probably pick something in the next five days. So is the reason that we're not going to send them all at the four second mark so that we don't pump the network? Um, and if that is the case, it's only 512 messages, right? So. And it just seems appealing to me to say, just send them all at four seconds um, and implement a cache if you want as well. Um, there's multiple reasons there. One would be there is this, you do want attestations well propagated uh, so that aggregation can happen at that eight second mark. Um, and so if you have the information that you need to send your message, uh, the idea is that it's an optimization to send your message when it's available, um, like when the correctness is available. And then that also is so that you can potentially get aggregated at a, at a higher success rate. But then that is also a um, does help stagger uh, so you don't have message blast. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. So going back to the case again, saying that the shuffling is known a day ahead um, 
I guess the, the problem that we're going to have is that if we get forks more than a day, if, if the network goes unstable, then we're going to, I guess the worst thing that happens is that cache is going to fill up. We're going to start dropping sync committee messages, which is not too bad, right? It is not too bad. And you've entered into somewhat of an extreme scenario and light clients might have issues then. But even then, um, even if you're not finalizing for uh, an entire day, the assuming that there was actually two forks that are deep of an entire day and that those networks are actually, those partitions in the network are actually communicating and not resolving that fork is like a, a, a more extreme issue in and of itself. I think the other thing to note is that the signature has the actual validator index. So you don't actually need the shuffling to be able to verify the signature anyway. Um, you do need to, to do all of the validations, like checking if they're in the sync committee. Um, so right. you're at worst bounded on the number of validators. Uh, and Oh, yeah. Yeah, because it's still... a proof as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you're right. So that does make it much easier to verify. Yeah, I mean, it, it's still a much bigger bound, but I, yeah. <laughs> I think if you just checked, you know, if you assume you're within a day that your head sync committee is the same and... Yeah, you don't bother caching it if they're not in the, the one your head is on. I mean, is there, yeah, is there, not, a a con cache. Is there not a, in a condition that says drop the message if they're not in the committee? I think there might be. Yeah, there is, but you can't validate that without the shuffling. Um, but I think it would be well, reasonable. Well, you have a shuffling. Have yeah, yeah. If, if you don't have the block, just use your head shuffling and cache it if, it, if, it's, if they're in the committee and then check properly once you get their block. But I think you're going to be fine. Yeah, I mean, uh, as you say, it's a stream case. I'm going to go look at how that condition is written, but I think the condition is should be written with respect to what you think the head is, not with respect to the message that was sent, in my opinion. But it's true because it has to match your head, doesn't it? Once you've got the block only, though, you don't know the parent. But yeah, that would be that would imply that it has to match the shuffling in your head. Okay, um, this issue was just uncovered a few hours ago, or at least since I was awake. Um, let's continue chatting about it offline and try to aim for a P2P related solution in the next few days. Um, otherwise, if we needed to get some better data on larger networks, then we can uh, take it there. Uh, Adrian, you mentioned something as an aside that was interesting that you were not getting aggregators. You weren't always getting aggregators on different sections of the um, think many subnets. Um, yeah. I believe the number of aggregators was the target number of aggregators is actually reduced um and that might be an error not an error but it might not be uh, a good thing so do you have any other data on that or should we i can look at um that number that target number and probabilities and we can chat offline if you don't have any other information um i think the key thing is to try it with a bigger set of validators so i've only got 2400 so i'm seeing duplicates in the same oh, community, okay. which we're not expecting. And that makes it less likely that you get an aggregator. Okay, that uh, makes sense. But yeah, it is definitely worth reviewing those numbers. Yeah. Um, okay. We'll flag that. Okay. Uh, any other Altair discussions? Discussion points? Cool. Um, let's remain pretty in active communication. I know everyone's slightly staggered on where they're at on this, uh, but hopefully mid to late next week, uh, more and more of us are communicating on some of these small dev nets. Let's shift into research updates. Does anybody have anything to share? I 
I can share something about sharding. We just had this merge call, so I'm not sure if we have like research updates between Altair and sharding. No, I think um, sharding is probably the main thing to, to share. Right, okay. So where we're currently at is uh, this updated sharding spec with a new state format. So this makes it easier to track confirmation data and keeps it all in one place to make a Merkle proof to the commitment easier. Um, generally happy with that piece of refactoring, but there is more. Um, so we're thinking of changing the way um, shard proposers are tasked with their, their proposals. Currently, we split shard proposers up, or we split validators up in shard committees. And then out of these committees, we select the proposers to keep the proposers um, per shard separate for um, a time window of about a day. And so this helps the network player, but within the spec, there's not really much to it. Um, the problem though is that it adds this caching complexity and that we can these incentives on a network player to stay on a topic for that long are relatively big. And then meanwhile, we have this discussion about MFE and how we should organize the, the, the mainnet chain. And we have this concept of separation of block builders and block proposers. And we could do something similar on the sharding layer where it's the block builder that um, pays a fee for the proposal for the to get the data there. And then the proposer selects a data transaction and they can select one without seeing the complete data. Um, so we may even end up with a model where the proposers can select data, can grab data. They don't have to learn all the layer twos. They don't have to uh, specialize as much. And then it's the uh, builder that with the, after paying the fee is then incentivized to make the data available by publishing it on the shared topic. And so we're looking into this change in incentives, how that could work. Um, it all fits in with regard to network timing and um, it does clean up various things. But of course, by changing this incentive, we uh, need to uh, carefully look at the change and see if it actually works. And then cut already noticed one possible issue and with a possible fix. Um, and we'll just create a PR to the specs repository to, to further discuss these uh, sharding change. Yeah, another thing I really like about uh, moving in this type of direction is that um, shard data transactions don't actually need to have the payload. And so there's not a, a, an excess of data being gossiped around pre-selection for, for, for inclusion, um, just kind of like the uh, commitment to that data and, and uh, proof, proof that you can pay a fee. Um, and so I think that would actually greatly reduce the bandwidth requirements, um, even in the event there's a, a competitive fee market or competitive landscape for getting trans uh, data into the charts. Right. Then there's this discussion about firewalling MFE. So making it open like flashbots, I think is really good. Is we should try and encourage every, every validator to... Uh, participate in a way that all these incentives are even. There's no validator with a lot more MFE or that has to do a lot, a lot of extra steps to specialize. Uh, if there's this market of builders, then those can specialize and we can firewall that away from the protocol. Um, and then um, it's basically the data, the data transaction that uh, 
first offers the data and then later the builder publishes the data. So we shift this um, availability um, problem towards the builder. And so this is good for privacy since we don't have to, uh, so it's like, if we have this very critical part of publishing the data, like, and this is a larger piece of data on the shards, if we move that away from the validator, from the consensus identity, and I mean, it can still be the same person, but if a builder can publish this and has an incentive to do this, then we can just separate it out. Um, and then um, also we remove this, this specialization need of validators. So whenever there is a new layer two, or whenever there is a new kind of dApp that wants to use shard data, they can just participate in this builder market instead. And the proposers, the shard proposers, can just keep doing their task and don't have to worry about these, these kind of niche changes. Cool. I, um, I think Proto is going to be working on a PR that highlights some of these changes soon. Um, and thinking about the um, after the merge, uh, so this is like sounds like this um, separate block builders sounds like an alternative to the execution services, right? So I will just prepare the payload, the entire payload for. Um, the proposer and proposer will need to be to sign off on it, right? Basically, yes. So there, there is no combination of multiple data, pieces of data on the proposer side. Um, we could try and fit that in, but I don't think we should go into that direction. As in, it's just much, much simpler. It's more minimal to this to do it this way. Yes. And then the yeah. builder can still combine different tabs. They can still combine data and fit it together in one block. And then we are thinking of like a standard outside of the protocol, but something that tabs would use. Think of it like the ERC20, or like which kind of layer this lives on. And we basically just need users of shard data to recognize which part of the shard blob is being used for which protocol or for which application. And so we need some kind of small header to say where to find data of specific tabs. So it's basically a combination of offsets and some kind of ID. We can figure this out at a later time. We're not quite there yet. Yeah, yeah. OK, so yeah, for the execution service, no, it will not be an alternative because it just allows for uh, building blocks uh, but uh, testers will have to execute the payload anyway. So yeah, okay. This is for shard data, so there's no execution, but. Yeah, 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 yeah right, data. right. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah, it's, yeah. A proto was just this mentioned in this uh, separation that was recently published. Right, um, so it is similar to the mainnet separation in a way that we do have builders, like this data still has meaning. It's just that the base protocol, the layer one, doesn't execute the data. But the builders will still want to execute their roll-up data and sequence transactions or whatever they want to do. And this is separate, it's a separate process from the shared proposer rule, which just needs to select data. Uh, and then uh, we shift this incentive from of the availability towards the builder. Um, and meanwhile, this it cleans up some of the networking, some of the, so the concerns around specialization of block building and whatnot. And uh, yeah, I think we'll just start with a PR and then we can discuss more. Sounds good. Other research updates? Um, yes. Uh... Just a quick comment. The, uh, the work that uh, I'm, I showed a couple of months ago about the resource consumption of the different clients, 
uh, will be uh, published at the uh, blockchain research uh, conference uh, in Paris in September. And there will be also a poster about the network crawlers uh, that we have been working on. And uh, uh, talking about the network crawler, we develop a new version of the crawler that can uh, run 24 seven and uh, gather data uh, continuously and it's charging a dashboard. Um, and so we are trying to uh, release this dashboard in the, in the coming weeks. And uh, another thing is that with Paritosh, we finally have a, f a first uh, minimal set of metrics that are uh, already existing across all the uh, clients. And we are just in the process of uh, deciding the best nomenclature, or the best names for these metrics, so that we can have some first uh, standard for um, the metrics across clients. And that's it on my, on my side. Got it. Thanks. Okay, any other research updates? Great. Um, anything else related to spec or um, any discussion points in general that we'd like to discuss before we close today? Okay, um, we will aim to get this P2P sync committee issue resolved in the coming days. Um, and we also are continuing to increase test coverage for Altair. So uh, we will expect a new very iterative release next week with additional tests then. Thank you. Um, really appreciate all the hard work and excited to see Altair moving. Talk soon. Bye. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Bye. 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 Bye.